Welcome to Little Cities Week. Uh, we have not let the COVID crisis keep us down. Uh, and as October approaches, our annual Little Cities of Black Diamonds Day date shows up on the calendar. But because of COVID, we've decided this year to uh, go online and do a virtual Little Cities Week instead of day. And it's a Little Cities Fest, we're calling it. Uh, our theme for the Little Cities of Black Diamonds this year is uh, roaring into the 20s, looking at the 1920s in the Little Cities of Black Diamonds region and uh, in the greater world. And there are great stories to be told about that era here in uh, southeastern Ohio as well as across the country. Tune in every evening this week at 7 p.m. for really engaging programs. And we'd really enjoy your support of our sponsors who will show up in these uh, programs, as well as your contributions at www.lcbdohio.org. Thank you and enjoy the show. My name is Tyler McDaniel, and um, I'm here alongside Grant Joy uh, here today. We're in Renville uh, in southeastern Perry County. Um, arguably, I think this is uh, one of the, or is the most uh, unique uh, and kind of special communities in the little city of the Black Diamonds region. Yeah, it really is. Uh, Renville has such a unique history, and it exemplifies, in my mind, sort of the best and most highest ideals that America has to offer. So I'm looking forward to talking about it. Yeah, I, same here, same here. Uh, it's, a, it's a really um, s small community. Actually, it is uh, currently the smallest incorporated community in the yeah, state I of Ohio. Yeah, I think it was about 2,000 people in sort of its uh, boom time, if you will. Uh, Renville is most notable, in my mind, uh, in the sense that uh, William P. Wren, who founded the town in 1879 as part of the Ohio Central Coal Company, uh, really wanted to in include Eastern Europeans and African Americans. He brought a lot of African Americans up from southern West Virginia uh, to uh, the mines here to work. One person in particular is a guy by the name of Adam Clayton Powell Sr. Um, Adam Clayton Powell senior is he's got a such a unique story um, in southern West Virginia he kind of experienced a, a life of vice if you will of gambling of sort of this rough and tumble kind of outlaw persona um, he got the Renville and still Renville was sort of like the Wild West when he showed up uh, in the late 18 early 1880s mm -hmm. and I think 1885 um, and and Clayton Powell uh, sort of had an epiphany, an awakening, if you will. He got baptized at what is now the Renville Artworks, uh, the Baptist church there. And uh, that sort of put him on a path that really shaped his career. Um, and he became a prominent figure in the religious movement here in Renville and actually went on to be, uh, to, to, really foster an important role in the re in being sort of a religious beacon in the Harlem Renaissance movement uh, in, in New York City there. Uh, Clayton Powell Sr. Uh, headed the Abyssinian Baptist Church uh, and the congregation had about 10,000 people at the time, uh, making it the largest Baptist congregation in the United States. And it's, it's really cool that he has roots here in Renville and his son, um, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., would actually go on to be the first African American elected in uh, Congress as a congressman uh, from New York. And he would actually spend his summers here in Renville. Um, and that is just one example of a notable figure here in Renville, and uh, there are others. So. And another great example is uh, Dr. Isaiah Tuppence, who uh, we were ta talking about before we started rolling here. Uh, very influential uh, individual and um, 
actually was the first African American to graduate from what became Ohio State University. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so uh, Dr. Tubbins, uh, from my knowledge, was sort of born in Tennessee, uh, mm -hmm. kind of moved up to Xenia, Ohio, Southwest Ohio there, spent his youth there, kind of moved back to Tennessee, and then eventually found his way to Ohio Central Medical College, I believe. And you're right, that would become uh, Ohio, Ohio State. State. Mm -hmm. And he became the first African American uh, to graduate from Ohio State University Medical School uh, with a doctorate degree. And he quickly found his way uh, to become sort of the company doctor for William P. Rind. And Isaiah Tuppins, uh, most notably, I think, helped kind of settle some uh, uh, racial tensions between sort of the nativist sen sentiment that existed in Corning and surrounding areas uh, while he was mayor. He was actually the first mayor in uh, Ohio history, the first African-American mayor. Um, and I think uh, one of the cool things about Dr. Tubbins is that he grew up sort of in poverty. Um, and you see sort of that progression up the socioeconomic ladder, if you will, and you see that notoriety that uh, Renville was able to afford its citizens in sort of achieving uh, economic uh, autonomy and importance. Mm -hmm. And it, it sort of represents that Du Boisian idea of almost the talented 10th. Um, and you see this in other communities such as Payne's Crossing and in Albany, where um, if, you know, if folks are progressive and, and are provided an opportunity and a fair shake, there is so much uh, just potential and success that people can have. And it really allowed Renville to flourish and the people here to uh, experience success. So Renville was established in 1879. In 1880, uh, in nearby Corning, two miles down the road of what is present day State Route 13, um, there was a murder of a white man. And uh, so as a result, um, uh, as a result, uh, sort of a vigilante mob, if you will, kind of formed, uh, and they marched down the Rinville, and uh, there was sort of a, a scuffle that uh, ensued. Um, three to four people were injured, um, all part of the um, sort of this vigilante group, um, but it was kind of settled in a peaceful way outside of that. Uh, they called in the National Guard, I believe, and uh, peace ensued. But it really, I think, encapsulates the racial tensions, the underlying racial tensions that existed in Southeast Ohio. Um, Renville uh, is kind of situated outside of Corning. Um, and much like, you know, Payne's Crossing is kind of on the edges of, it straddles the, the county line there of Perry and Hawking County, but you can think of it as being on the fringes of society. Renville in some ways was like that in that, um, you know, it did provide some inclusion and uh, some insulation from the racial animosities that existed. However, um, again, in 1889, I want to say, um, there was also another incident, um, uh, uh, sort of a group of angry Corning folks uh, got together and sort of outsiders and came down the Renville, but the mayor at the time, Dr. Isaiah Tubbins, the first African-American mayor, uh, was able to call on the law enforcement and settle that in a peaceful manner. Um, and again, I think uh, in Corning, there was a fear of not just African-Americans, but also Eastern Europeans um, driving down the cost of wages. And so I think in some ways, um, you know, the nativist miners uh, saw that as sort of jeopardizing their economic livelihood and uh, and not allowing them to provide for their family. So you do see this animosity and tension, but it does progress and, you know, in the 1920s and 30s up to the 60s, uh, racial progression mirrors that of the country and things kind of harmonize and, and get better. So um, it, Renville, uh, in a lot of ways as a progressive community, but it also, uh, it did have its share of racial animosity. And it's a great example of, of America's highest ideas of equality, of freedom, and equity of opportunity, so.
Grant, you gave us a good background on some of the firsts of Renville, the people that came here from here and were the first in the nation or first in Ohio. Yeah, Renville's uh, such a historic place for a lot of different reasons. And um, I'm excited to hear more about some historic people in Renville. Um, so, you know, Richard L. Davis, arguably one of the most influential African-American labor organizers of the early labor movement in the United States, but a figure that I don't think is well known on the national scale the way he should be. So I'm anxious to hear more about that, Burr. Well, Richard L. Davis came with his family from Virginia in 1882 to Renville, started working in the mines and was already uh, politicized about unionizing. And then um, when the United Mine Workers of America was founded in Columbus in 1890, he really got involved and he left Renville and he spread the gospel of the United Mine Workers of America all across the Appalachian coal fields in various states and was single-handedly responsible for signing up some 20,000 black miners into the United Mine Workers of America. He came back here, he was blacklisted and couldn't work in the Renville mines. So he became a constable. I think that was the last job he had before he died, kind of a tragic story in 1900. But before that, um, and in and around his union organizing, in the southern states, in the coal fields, in other states besides Ohio, um, he was up for the executive council of the United Mine Workers Executive Board. He missed it just by a few votes the first time and the second time he was elected, served two terms on the executive committee of the National Union uh, as secretary treasurer. And now a little bit about William P. Wren, the founder of this town. You know, was he particularly uh, abolitionist? He was a, a veteran of the Civil War, came from Ireland, and taught for a while in Maryland. And he, um, he had philosophies about slavery. He was anti-slavery. And so he joined the Union Army. After the Civil War, he became a pretty successful industrialist and railroad operator in the Chicago area. And we know from uh, history that he started five mines in Pennsylvania, in the western part of the state, and five mines here in the Renville area. I think a lot of people can really understand uh, William P. Wren by his handling of the Hocking Valley coal strike of 1884 and 1885. With a population of African American miners, and miners from six or seven international locations that came here knowing no English, they all got along. And they participated in the Great Hocking Valley coal strike on the side of things. See, that strike, as we talked about before, was caused because um, the mine operators lost their rail transportation contracts to higher rail costs. And they formed a syndicate and they decided to jointly drop the price per ton that miners could make all across these little cities of the Black Diamonds. And so miners couldn't take that. It was, uh, Cheryl Blosser says, some 20 to 30 uh, cent drop in the tonnage uh, rate that they were paid. So they went out on strike, but, but Renville miners didn't have to go on strike because William P. Wren, he was a railroad guy. He, brought the, he developed the Ohio Central Railroad through this town. The Renville miners, um, according to Christopher Evans in his United Mine Workers of America history volumes, paid a dollar every payday to benefit the strike fund for those two years, 1884 and 1885 of the Great Hocking Valley coal strike. That's really cool. It it's really speaks to the through uh, tumultuous times. That's really remarkable. Well, in all these towns, um, Corning, Shawnee, and then later Santoy and Congo, uh, there were black communities like Payne's Crossing that were on the side. But even in New Straitsville, they worked together underground. Yeah. But they went home. Here, 
you know, the, the, the stories documented, the pictures of, uh, from residents who uh, saved memories from their parents and grandparents, show blacks and whites in school together, in churches, in pool halls, here in Renville, interacting and getting along. And it's been said that the, the reason for that was they all came here and they were all kind of on an equal playing field. Um, the blacks never interacted with whites that much, but the international whites without the, the use of, or facility of the English language, um, they, they had to find a way to get along and they did. You are on and running. Okay. We are here at Payne's Crossing, and Payne's Crossing is notable for being an early example of an African American community in rural America, in a rural space. Um, so the Normans, the Letts, um, as well as the Harpers were some notable early residents that settled in the valley to my left here. And they settled here in roughly the 1830s. Roughly around the 1860s, um, the Payne family, brothers Thomas and, uh, oh no, Thomas and Evan Payne. Say that again, brothers. Brothers Thomas and Evan Payne fought at the uh, Battle of New Market and the Battle of Petersburg in the Civil War, the Battle of the Crater, uh, and they were Civil War veterans. You'll actually notice, if you look at a lot of the headstones of Payne's Crossing, um, they're marked with uh, the G-A-R symbol. Uh, and a lot of the uh, troops that fought in the United States, collared troops during the Civil War, um, there's a handful of, of, of soldiers, that, of veterans that fought during the Civil War uh, that are buried here behind me in Payne's Crossing Cemetery. Um, and Payne's Crossing is most notable not just in the sense that it's a it's an African American space in in a rural setting, but in being so, um, they achieved a great deal of economic success. Uh, some residents had property values of roughly about a thousand dollars back in the mid 1800s, and that would have been a lot of money back then. Um, so uh, this space really. Uh, in my mind, is important because it allows African Americans to achieve economic upward mobility in, in ways that they weren't able to before, as well as you see uh, community being fostered virtually uh, in, in valleys and the ravines below when there, when there wasn't any sort of uh, homesteads or farmsteads. So it's really cool. Uh, in some ways, they were pushed to the fringes of society, but in being so, they they cultivated and built a community essentially uh, out of nothing. And to me, that's really, really awesome uh, to see. All right, behind me now, you will notice that we are on the Hawking and Perry County line. Uh, and that's significant in a lot of ways because um, due to the racial animosity and, and the racial tensions that existed, slavery and such, um, African Americans were pushed quite literally to the fringes of society um, back in the 19th century and sort of as on their quest to achieve freedom and equality. And by the 1880s, uh, sort of around as the Hawking Valley coal boom kind of burst onto the scene, uh, Eastern Europeans, in a lot of ways, settled this same uh, area that African Americans had already settled. And so we find um, uh, sort of racially integrated households, uh, com communities intermarrying and things. And so it really sort of mirrors, in a lot of ways, the racial progress of the time, but in the same way that African Americans were alienated from larger society, uh, Eastern European immigrants were forced, in a lot of ways, uh, to settle that same land and, and really faced sort of alienation um, from the larger native society uh, that existed in these little cities. So 
that's just a little tidbit. Uh, historically, uh, Payne's Crossing is similar. This idea is similar to a maroon society, if you will, that was more so uh, involved in the Deep South. Uh, and it's the same idea of folks being pushed to the fringes, but in doing so, they, they foster community uh, and, and out of these rural, isolated, almost desolate places. So it speaks to uh, the character, the resolve, the persistence, and the ingenuity that, that these folks possessed. Hi everybody, uh, this is Tyler McDaniel here today, and I'm sitting next to Mr. David Butcher. Uh, he, we are um, actually here uh, outside of Stewart, Ohio at, uh, well, very near uh, Tabletown. Right. Is that right? Yes. Col uh, AKA Kilbert. <laughs> yes. It's actually called Kilbert. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the uh, technical name of it. But mm -hmm. uh, we've actually learned a little bit about um, what has, um, or actually how that name uh, came to be. And actually, it was named Tabletown prior to that. And right. It's the original, mm -hmm. I suppose, town name. Yes, it was. So uh, I guess we, we could go into, into a little bit uh, about that. Um, so uh, you were saying that Tabler Town um, had its start really in the uh, early 1800s. Yes, uh, my ancestors um, came from Virginia, which is now West Virginia, and uh, they are uh, of my grandfather, which is many times back, freed six slave children and brought them to Ohio in the 1830s. And from my generation back, we called it Tabler Town. And how it got switched from Tabler Town to Kilbert was when the railroads came in the 1850s, and they got here in the 1830s. So um, when the railroads came, the engineer that was laying out the tracks saw that, that Tabler Town was not an official name. And um, he went to the courthouse and registered under his name. His name was Sam Kilbert. So that's how it became. Uh, Kilbert instead of Tabler Town. So it was actually just kind of like uh, uh, an accident, really, yeah. that it uh, yeah. happened to not be re registered. And, yeah. And uh, we I, hope to change that. Yeah, and that's what <laughs> you, you were saying. We were, we're yeah. you know, uh, hopefully that yeah. that original name can be, be restored because really that's um, mm. that's the true history right. of this area. It's, it's not that engineer that was here. Right. It was, uh, you know, your family's history and the families that settled here. Yeah, put it this way, the Kilberts are long gone and the Tabers are still here. They, that's <laughs> right, yeah. And uh, your, your family history uh, is so fascinating. You were explaining it uh, to us when you were showing us around your, um, your museum there. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very, one of the most fascinating stories, I think, for me personally, that I've got to hear in, in a very long time. Well, thank um, you. Yeah, it, and um, I guess we, we could go into a little bit of detail and like how um, you were explaining the um, kind of the circumstances mm -hmm. that uh, how your um, great great or several greats back uh, mm -hmm. grandparents met. Mm -hmm. um, the one line that I come down here uh, is one of the children that was emancipated in 1830. His name was William, and William married Ruth Corbin. And uh, she was given to the Grosvenor family in Athens uh, as a child. And somewhere along the line, where she came down to the mill in Tabler Town to get some of the new famous white flour or wheat flour, as some of them referred it to, uh, she met my grandfather somewhere along the line, and uh, they married. So that's one of the first uh, marriages of what we call Native American ancestry we have in our family. Now, William, he is descendant of Michael, which was born in 1774. And uh, his family came here in 70, 1732 on a ship called the Samuel. And so he's born a couple generations later. So he was born before the country was founded. And uh, the oral history was that he fell in love with... Um, one of his father's slaves because when they got here they weren't poor they all they obviously had money they acquired thousands of acres and had hundreds of slaves um michael has feelings for one of uh, his father's slaves named hannah so our oral history passed down for well over 150 years now tells us that he really cared for hannah and the father his father disapproved 
and dispersed Hannah and her other children to different plantations because now all of his children have plantations. Michael started acquiring uh, his family back. We believe he purchased Hannah in 1813 from his sister, possibly freed her in 1818. Then we know the oral history told us that he was um, trying to acquire and did acquire six of her children in 1830. Uh, in 1830, right after the manumission document was written up, he, you know, they were now free. He, that's when we believe that the migration from Virginia, which is now West Virginia, the Martinsburg area, uh, Wheeling, um, is when they came to Tabertown. Well, it wasn't Tabertown when they came here, but when they got, there were so many of them when they came here, people just referred to it as Tabertown. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. So essentially the whole family coming here yeah. created its own little community. small community. Yeah, right. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. And uh, you're also saying too, um, when, when we were uh, get, getting the tour, you said that um, where you live is actually very near to uh, Federal Creek. Yes. And, uh, and that, that story goes back to the uh, origins of really Ohio University, the Cutler family. Yes. So uh, this is a very, you know, kind of historic part of Athens County right through here that, and a lot of people don't really know the whole <laughs> Absolutely history right. A lot of people don't know about this history. Right. But the Pioneer Cemetery, which is right here at the mouth of Federal Creek, is the oldest non-native cemetery in Athens County. So this is where the very first pioneers came to Athens County. It's in the late 1700s. What is fascinating to me is I've been in this cemetery a thousand times. A thousand times. And a few years ago, I was given a, a tour with a group from Ohio University. And um, one of the professor's wives is looking at these old, old worn out sandstones. And she points at the stone and says, oh, my God, there's a menorah. I said, what are you talking about? She said, there's a menorah on that stone. And it's so faded and light, you can't hardly see it. But now this is a whole different ballgame. Our earliest pioneers that came here are of Jewish descent that no one talks about. Now. I've never heard anybody talk about it. Yeah. So... There's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> there is. Yeah. And I think that's, that's one of the lessons, I think, with history is mm, that, yeah. you know, no matter what, I think there's always something else yeah. to be dug up. Yes. Yeah, okay. it's very fluid. <laughs> when the big mines left, people here were still trying to survive. So a lot of our ancestors tried to reopen mines and, and mine, right? And I just learned this. As I said, you know, history... It's fluid, but it's also, as uh, James Baldwin said, it's, it's now. You know, a lot of people try to look at history as in past, but I just discovered this, so that makes it now that I just learned this history. The coal mines here around Tabertown, there was several that people tried to open, but the Jenkins mine, um, he was, he had black and white coal miners working for him. I just was visiting one of our ancestors whose father worked for the Jenkins. Jenkins was a, a person of color. The person I'm visiting was Gladys Flowers. Her father worked for Mr. Jenkins. And so this would have been 75 years ago. And I started asking her about the coal mines, what it was like for your dad, and she said, if I had, if we had to depend on my father's income from working in the coal mine, we would have starved to death. And I said, what do you mean? How, how you? She said, Mr. Jenkins would pay at the end of the week. If he did not have money to pay everybody, he would only pay the white coal miners. The black coal miners were his ancestors, and he knew they would come back. It was, you know, like I said, probably 75 years ago. She's in her 70s. She is still angry about it, upset how hurt it was because it was hard, so hard for their family. Uh, you know, they were going without, and their father was going to work every day and coming home and not having anything. And then I... 
spoke with my wife's grandmother, Nellie, who's 98 years old. And <laughs> she still has a disdain for these coal mine owners here because of the same thing. And uh, I, I just found that heartbreaking, but it's also fascinating. And I know it was very, very hard for her family as well, being the son, you know, she was married to a coal miner. Now, Grandma Nellie, her name is Nellie Singer Flowers. She's 98. But Nellie told me that, uh, and other people that I met that knew her husband, I wasn't fortunate enough to meet him. His name was Jack Flowers. People didn't care what color you were when you went down into a coal mine. They, what they cared about was how much coal you could shovel in a day's time, because that's how I'm going to get paid. Jack Flowers, my wife's grandfather, was short and stocky, and they said there was no man alive that could keep up with him shoveling coal, and everybody else was using what they called a number eight shovel. He was using what we call snow shovel, and he could shovel coal. And I, I talked to a guy who actually worked side by side with him and, you know, everybody wanted to work with Jack Flowers. So these guys were going to work and working hard and then coming home. And can you imagine going, uh, you know, working two weeks and maybe not getting paid? You know, this is, you're barely making it anyway. So she's 98 years old and still this day she's angry about it and has every right to be. I'm finding here, there, there was no segregation here. As early as I can tell, as going back and interviewing people that were in their 100, you know, 100 years old when I was 16, they all worked together, whether it be farming or mining. Um, Tabor Town is made up of, now that we have this amazing thing called DNA and research, um, there are people who have Native American, African American, Irish, German, and but yet still uh, there are people that fit this category. In our area, they are people of color. Uh, I have ancestors that look just like you and look just like you and some that look like me. Uh, it's, it's amazing we have, I was explaining uh, to you in there uh, about the coal mines, there was a gentleman named George Flowers on my wife's side of the family. And uh, he was killed in the big four mine. Well, George, he looked like a full-blooded Irishman. You know, red hair, beard, and I got a photo of him and his, what we would call his African-American son, which is pretty cool, I think, you know. So even today, the characteristics, we have people of color here who are very light complected, uh, red hair, blue eyes, green eyes, um, who are considered people of color here. So I think that's fascinating that it's carried on. <laughs> what about the, the only story that I can recall uh, my father told me of my grand, my dad was Robert Lewis Butcher, born in 1938, no, 1928. His father was Reverend Lewis Butcher that was born in 1904. <clears throat> they lived up on Hagee Ridge here, and which is, you know, just a mile or so from here. And some of our other ancestors lived there, one called the Holbert family. The Holbert family is a real old name. And um, one of the, my grandfathers that lived on that ridge was actually born in Canada. That's when I was talking about, you know, that book, The Bone and Sinew of the Land by Dr. Cox. I always wondered why my ancestors went to Canada in 1850. This is way before the Civil War. Well, it's because of Blacks going into the Northwest Territory and clearing land in the 1830s. Once the land was cleared, which took 20 years, whites would come in and run them off and take the land. So that kind of opened my eyes to why some of my ancestors left here and went to Canada, came back, fought the Civil War, 
went back to Canada and moved back, and some of them stayed, some, you know. So that's some of the earliest things I've heard. And then, uh, so back to my, my grandfather, who's a minister now, who used to <laughs> make moonshine, who became a minister. I actually have a photo in there of my grandfather, who was a bootlegger in West Virginia, came here, bootlegged, and um, joined the church through my grandmother, convinced him to join the church, and actually became a minister. So he started a church up on Hagee Ridge there. So it, the story was that some people from another community came to Hagee Ridge and had burnt a cross in front of my grandfather's home, the man who had moved from Canada. And he was terrified. Uh, my dad said that Lewis got his brother and probably everybody else he could get a hold of and went to this community, uh, like let's just say it was a town hall meeting, the kind of way he kind of explained it. And he announced that if there was ever another cross burnt within 100 miles of Huggy Ridge, he was coming back to burn the whole town to the ground. And to my knowledge, that was the end of the Ku Klux Klan <laughs> coming in here and, and starting some stuff. So I was proud of my grandfather for doing that. So these were tough people, you know, and we're still tough people. I tell when, uh, you know, this coronavirus is very serious, you know, our people will survive. We are the, you know, we, we come from very hardy stock and uh, how we're going to do it, I don't know yet because we got a long way to go, I was telling but um uh, we didn't come this far to give up. <laughs> but Ohio seems to have the distinction of having more Klan members than any other state of the Union, with perhaps 400,000 members at its peak. As one historian has observed, during the 1920s it seemed that the mask and hood had become the official symbol of the Buckeye State. So here we have um, initiates into the Klan in Middletown, Ohio. Wood County, Ohio, uh, the Klan liked to go to uh, schoolhouses and present them with the, an American flag and then they would have some kind of presentation by the Klan. Wood County, if you don't know, is up near Toledo. Here we have the Klan in Lima, Ohio and Springfield, Ohio. Um, the Lima, if you can read the caption regarding Lima, that on that night 3,000 were being inaugurated into the Klan. Big march again in Springfield. Akron, women of the Ku Klux Klan. Youngstown, I'm coming back to Youngstown because Youngstown, it was very, the Klan was very big. There's Youngstown. And then um, Marietta. So you can see it's throughout the state, including southeastern Ohio. What made the Klan so appealing to so many Americans in the 1920s is that it presented itself as a supremely patriotic organization. The phrase they used was 100% American. And to be 100% American in the 1920s meant that you were white and you were determined to keep black people in their place. When Klansmen were initiated into the organization, the membership sang the revival hymn, Just as I am without one plea. And Jesus was represented as the first Klansman. But to be 100% American in the 1920s did not just mean you were a white Christian. To be 100% American also meant being a white Protestant Christian. In the years between 1890 and 1920, a flood of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe came to America and came to Ohio and came to Southeastern Ohio to work in the coal mines. These immigrants were primarily Catholic and Jewish. In the eyes of the Klan, such immigration was polluting and, and endangering America. As Colonel Simmons put it, America is not a melting pot, it's a garbage can. And it's the Catholics and Jews who are the garbage. Now, the Klan was clearly anti-Semitic. They still are today, actually. 
They were much more worried about the Catholics. There were so many more of them, and they focused their hatred against Catholics. So if you take a look at Klan newspapers from the 20s, and I've spent a lot of time in the Klan newspapers, it's just one attack after another on Catholics and Catholicism. The, the, in Ohio, it's anti-Catholicism that was the number one driver of uh, Klan organizing and Klan hatred. One of the main features of the Ohio KKK newspapers was its monthly list of Klan rallies. And I'm going to give you a small sample of Ohio cities and towns in 1923 and 24 that hosted major rallies, often with thousands or even tens of thousands of people in enthusiastic attendance. So just listen to this list, and this is a partial list. I'm not giving you the entire list from 23-24. Bowling Green, Camden, Cincinnati, Coshocton, Dover, Elyra, Finley, Greenville, Hamilton, Hillsboro, Jefferson, Lima, Lisbon, Marion, New Philadelphia, Orville, Painesville, Plain City, Sydney, Springfield, Urbana, Troy, Xenia, Zanesville. As far as urban centers of Klan activity in the 1920s, two cities, one from the east and one from the west, were at the top of the list. Youngstown and Dayton. In fact, these two cities were in the top six in the United States in terms of highest percentage of residents who were Klan members. The other four cities were Dallas, Denver, Portland, Oregon, and Indianapolis. Both Youngstown and Dayton had populations of, of around 150,000. Both cities had an influx of large numbers of Catholic immigrants and smaller numbers of Jewish immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe to work in factories. And this influx of, quote, aliens, unquote, bred a great deal of Protestant resentment, white Protestant resentment. Let's start with Youngstown. Running on a campaign for public morality, uh, which basically meant let's enforce prohibition and let's enforce Sunday closing laws, both of which were aimed at Catholics. The Klan candidate in Youngstown was elected mayor in November 1923. Same for four nearby towns. In fact, in, in the Youngstown area, it was a KKK sweep of mayoral elections. By 1924, the Klan was a power throughout New Northeast Ohio, routinely holding torchlight parades with tens of thousands of marchers. But particularly in Niles, Ohio, Italian and Irish Catholic immigrants armed themselves with guns, clubs, and knives to fight back against the Klan. And by the summer of 1924, they had ignored, organized themselves into something they called the Knights of the Flaming Circles. Because of repeated altercations between the Flaming Circle and the KKK, the Klan mayor of Niles, yes, a Klansman mayor of Niles, tempor temporarily prohibited Klan rallies. But he got elected because of the KKK. And so after Klan pressure, he gave the Klan a permit to hold a march through the city on November 1. Uh, I have struggled to find good photos of this event. Here's a, um, a newspaper article. They're preparing for the rioting, rioting because they know there's going to be a fight between the Flaming Circle and the KKK. Um, this is a terrible photo, and it's actually the best I have here. The Klansmen are gathering for their parade in Niles. Thousands of Klansmen marched on November 1, 1924, to be met by thousands of members of the Flaming Circle. Things quickly deteriorated, out of control, not a big surprise, and there was 18 hours of full-blown rioting. There were many injuries, but remarkably, no deaths. The governor finally declared martial law, which lasted 10 days, and which brought order to the town of Niles. But there's no question that the Italian and the and Irish immigrants won the battle. Song of the Knights of the Flaming Circle. In the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan was a huge presence in the state of Ohio and throughout the nation. 
The Klan peaked around the year 1925, the year of this incredible march. But over the next few years, in the late 20s, the Klan suffered a precipitous decline in the U.S. and in Ohio. Afflicted by a series of scandals, the most famous of which involved the leader of the Indiana KKK, who raped and murdered his secretary, the Klan had dwindled in influence and numbers by 1930. But before it faded, the second KKK achieved major victories. For one thing, it helped ensure that white supremacy would remain the order of the day in the South for the next few decades. More than this, the second KKK won the day on immigration. Thanks in good part to the Klan's efforts, Congress passed the 1924 Immigration Quota Act. Just to explain this cartoon, you have all these folks from Europe wanting to come into America, and Uncle Sam is funneling, taking only a small percentage. This law, which remained on the books until the 1960s, established that each year 85% of all immigrants from Europe would come from Northern and Western Europe, from Protestant Europe. Only 15% per year would come from Southern and Eastern Europe, Catholic and Jewish Europe. It also established there would be no immigrants from Asia. One of the tragic effects of this law came in the 1930s and 1940s. As Nazi Germany established its control of much of Southern and Eastern Europe, it was di very difficult for Jewish refugees from these regions to get into the United States, thus facilitating their eventual execution in Nazi death camps. While the Second Klan faded from view in the 1920s, it did not die. A third Klan emerged in the 1950s and 60s to lead the charge against the Civil Rights Movement, in the process bringing back the Confederate flag, which had all but disappeared, as a symbol of white dominance. And now we are afflicted with a newly revived KKK, which, as always, is about white rights. In U.S. history, we have had an ongoing conflict over what it means to be an American. On the one hand, we have those who argue that anyone can become an American, along with being able to speak basic English, having a rudimentary understanding of American history and government. One simply needs to affirm his or her loyalty to the ideas and ideals articulated in the Constitution. That's one side of things. But on the other hand, we have those in this country who argue that to be truly and fully American, one needs to be the right race, the right ethnicity, the right religion. This is the view held by the 1920s KKK and still is held by the KKK. Here in 2020, one century after the second Ku Klux Klan, it's not clear whether the Klan was on the winning or the losing side of the argument over what it means to be an American. Thank you.